In the shadowy corners of folklore and unexplained phenomena, there lurks a creature known as the Dog Man. Described as a terrifying fusion of man and canine, it stands on hind legs but can run amazingly fast on all four as well. It exhibits humanoid traits blended with the fearsome aspects of a wolf or large dog. This enigmatic entity has been the subject of numerous sightings and tales, especially recently, striking fear and curiosity into the hearts of those who dare to delve into its mysterious existence. I'm your ghost, John. This is the 21 CD Podcast. Let's get into it. Hello citizen. Be advised this content creator is human and is therefore subject to human error. Remember, trust your government, consume appropriate content, and be cautious of all conspiracy theories as they are the tools of the rebellion. Hey everybody, welcome back to the 21 CD Podcast. If this is your first time here, welcome. As always, I'm your ghost, John. Before we get going, just want to remind you guys to like, follow, and subscribe, and a little share never hurt anybody. Um, wherever you guys are listening or uh, watching. If you guys are listening on Spotify or Apple or some other podcast platform, don't forget you can always watch me on YouTube in 4K. And if you guys are on the YouTube but you're looking for something a little more uh, versatile, you can go ahead and find me on Spotify, Apple, or pretty much any other podcast platform. Just Google 21 CD Podcast and you'll probably find something that'll work for you. For all updates on the podcast, you're going to want to subscribe to the Instagram at 21CD Podcast. That's where you're going to get all the news about what kind of episodes I'm uploading next, where I'm uploading them to, because some episodes get banned and they end up on Rumble. And also, if I'm out in the woods doing some kind of stealth camping or monster hunting, all those updates are going to be on the Instagram. A lot of stuff coming this year. The year is young and I have not even begun to put out the kind of content that I'm looking at putting out. So having all of you guys um, in the loop is important. Now I know what you're thinking. Uh, really? Another Dogman episode? Didn't we just have a Dogman episode? Yep, we sure did. But I had so much content that I was hoping to talk about and put in that episode but unfortunately, I just didn't have the time. So we're back for another little episode on Dogman. This isn't going to be a full length. This is sort of a uh, half length episode on Dogman. And it's going to, I'm just going to tell you guys some of the stories that I didn't get to tell you in the last episode. You guys really liked that Dogman episode. And so I figured, why not? I'll give them a little more. And um, yeah, so I hope you guys like this. These are just stories. There's not going to be a whole lot of dialogue from me about what I what I really think or any sort of philosophical stuff. There might be a little bit because it's me, but mainly um, this is going to be just storytelling time with John. So that's what we're doing today. And without further ado, I will just get right into it. Uh, the first story comes from someone out of North Carolina who reported the following. Driving home on a winding mountain road in the western North Carolina Appalachians, my friend and I were enveloped in the pitch darkness. The absence of streetlights amplifying the night's intensity. Suddenly, an oncoming truck swerved into our lane, 
prompting a quick response from my friend, who slammed the brakes and blared the horn. The truck corrected its course, but our nerves were already jangled. Jangled. Such a good word. As we cautiously proceeded, the cause of the swerve revealed itself. A large deer carcass sprawled across the road. What truly captured our attention, though, was the creature crouched over it. In the glow of our headlights, illuminated by the brights my friend had switched on, was what seemed like an immense wolf. Its long, sparsely furred front legs bent over the carcass. This animal was unlike any wolf I'd encountered in my work with them. Its size was astounding. As our truck inched closer, it raised its head, and the headlights fully caught its features. Jet black fur, robust, muscular forearms, and striking golden orange eyes that bore an eerie resemblance to human eyes. Both of us gasped in unison at the sight. Without a word, my friend continued driving. Only when we were a safe distance away did we turn to each other, both uttering in disbelief, that was a werewolf. This was particularly startling coming from my friend who had always been a skeptic of the supernatural. The remainder of our journey was cloaked in silence, the event literally too surreal for words. We only spoke of it once more, confirming the details of what we'd witnessed. At that time, I was unaware of the legend of Dogman. This eerie encounter slipped from my memory only to resurface two years later when a similar creature appeared in my own backyard. If you're intrigued, I'm willing to share the details of that spine-chilling experience as well. I was not able to find the story of the uh, second experience in the backyard. It, this, this article, this, this uh, account comes from somebody who, after this, deleted their, um, their Reddit account, and I, I, there's nothing else by them. But pretty creepy. You know, in the last Dogman episode, we talked a little bit about how um, Dogman seems to be sort of a scavenger of roadkill a lot of the times. He seems to be eating what's, on, what's already dead on the side of the road. Because if you think about it, it doesn't make sense to kill anything on the road. A lot of animals and beings, creatures of all types, are kind of scared of roads because of how hazardous it is with people speeding by and just the openness of a, uh, a road in general. It's not somewhere you really want to be caught. Even in the military, we're taught to be very cautious of crossing roads because it's sort of a zone where you can be spotted and potentially compromised. So it seems like this is yet another report of Dogman scavenging on the side of the road, eating roadkill. Pretty interesting. Another story comes from someone who has completely vanished from the internet altogether as well. I found this story and just had to share it. This happened when I was much younger. I'd have to ask my parents when the camping trip happened to tell you how many years ago it was, but I can assure you it was at least a decade ago. Now I'm going to use some questionable words for describing the location, words like wooded and wilderness reserve, because I don't know the best words for this sort of thing. Around a decade ago, a friend from church asked me to join his family on a camping trip to a wilderness reserve called Oasis State Park. Of course, since this was my best friend and his family had always been nice, I said yes. Up until that point, I had only camped rarely. So the prospect of camping with a friend and his family seemed absolutely amazing. So we began preparing for a weekend when I wasn't busy. I got my own tent, my own sleeping bag, and my own supplies. Once all that was gathered, the father of the friend came and picked me up, and my parents waved me off. There are quite a few things I remember from that trip. The amazingly hostile yet beautiful New Mexico countryside. The plateaus and the campsite. The New Mexican wilderness isn't something a lot of people fantasize about camping in. At least not so far as I know. But Oasis State Park is different. The camping plots are all nice, even if the best are always taken. There's a pretty lake, lots of wildlife, and I hate to admit, more trees than I've ever seen in town. Yeah, I know, nobody thinks of multitudes of trees when they think of New Mexico, and for good reason. They aren't the most common occurrence in the plains unless planted by people. Regardless, 
Oasis has enough for me to just use the term woods for the sake of brevity. So anyways, we found ourselves a plot and began setting up our tents. By afternoon, the tents were set, and me and my friend ditched his oh-so-boring younger sister in favor of exploring the park. The memories are fantastic. We found a snake by the lake and watched it drink from the water before slithering off quickly. We explored a place I remember was very sandy. We watched a roadrunner doing its thing. We played all day after lunch and saw so many amazing things that by the end of the day, I never would have thought anything could go wrong. We finished the day like you always do, by collecting sticks and starting a fire to eat s'mores and tell ghost stories. None of the stories were scary, probably because me and my friend were kids and his sister was an even younger child. That and his father was lead singer at our church and making children cry was bad for his reputation. So, by ghost stories, I mean little jokes of stories designed to make us giggle more than cry. Yeah, it was lame, but what do you expect? Anyways, shortly after the stories were said and the s'mores were eaten, we retired, me to my tent and my friend, his father, and his sister to their tent. Now for this setup, I'll explain positioning. This is all going to be important. My tent was at one edge of the plot and my friend's tent was at the exact opposite. This was for privacy reasons. Now at my end of the plot was a mini trail that led through thick brush to the lake. Also, about three feet from my tent was like a little tree. I don't know what kind of tree it was, but it was still young and small. The trail to the lake was to the left of my tent entrance. The lake was behind it, and a thin tree line sat across a trail in front of my tent. That trail in front of my tent led to the bathrooms. So I went to bed without a single bit of fear, and before I did, I went ahead and urinated on the tree outside my tent because of laziness. Screw the two-minute walk to the bathrooms when nature's toilet was outside my tent. So I finished closing up my tent for the night and climbed into my sleeping bag to go to bed. I don't know how long I slept, but when I woke, I had to use the bathroom again, and it wasn't the kind of pottying I could do on a tree, or at least not reasonably. So I, not being a moron, who would just wander through the dark, grabbed my little lantern. I flipped on my LED lantern and I unzipped the inner flap of my tent before the outer, as if that little nylon net could protect me from what I was about to see. Now I should mention that outside of cities in New Mexico, it's quite common to hear coyote howls. It's a nightly occurrence when camping. Heck, even up in a little village like Logan, you can hear the howls from your bedroom. It isn't so unnerving when you're in a house, but when you got some flimsy nylon walls to protect you and that's it, well, it isn't the most comforting sound. As I unzipped my tent flap, I did hear a few howls, but they were distant and not worrying. What stunned me into stillness was a very loud howl from the direction of the lake, about a yard from my tent at most. This howl was different though. It had the feel of a coyote howl, but it was deeper and it lasted much longer. I simply sat there petrified at what I had heard. I wouldn't be able to guess at how long I sat there breathing hard with my fingers still grasping the zipper, but however long it may have been was just long enough for the thing that made the howl to come up the trail next to my tent. Suddenly, I heard the crunching of claws on dirt, and after that, claws on the rocks that made our camping plots. Then I saw the largest shadow made by a living creature that I had ever seen. It lumbered heavily in the direction of the sparse tree line where I assumed the other howling had come from, but before it got past the tree I urinated on, it stopped. I realized only then that I was both lit like a candle and had not been trying to silence my heavy breathing. By then it was too late as that hulking thing lumbered over closer to the tree and into the light of my lantern. As dim as the light was at that distance, it was just barely enough to make out details. I'd like to note a few very important details that stuck out to me as odd. It had roughly the fur coloring of a coyote, but that classic dogman head shape with the tiny pointed ears, too small to make sense. It also made strange noises as it lowered to all fours in front of my tent. 
popping sounds like joints rubbing together as I can only assume its knees busted out of their standing joints and fell into different joints to support all fours. It briefly ignored the very obviously frightened me in my tent as it sniffed the tree I had urinated on. The breaths were similar to a dog's but longer and far deeper, almost like a horse's. Then, that thing turned to me and stared straight into my eyes. Its eyes didn't glow, they didn't peer into my soul, but they were unbelievably unnatural. Above all the things I saw in those eyes, I saw a predator. Have you ever been in a position where you made eye contact with a beast that you know is stronger than you? Something you know could just kill you, and you know that it knows that you know just looking for seemingly so long that I thought for sure I'd just be a bloody stain by the time anyone reached my tent. Screaming would probably do nothing. I doubted a gun would even hurt this thing, but despite every feeling in my gut, despite the dread of knowing it was predator and I was prey, I didn't die. Instead, it just turned slowly, ever so slowly, and just sprinted off into the woods just gone into the night faster than it came. I have one personal friend who knows this story and jokes and says that it was probably my urine on the tree that scared it off, like I marked my territory or something dumb like that, or maybe it just wasn't hungry, or most improbable, it had just enough morals to not kill a kid. I'll never really know. Needless to say, I didn't go to the bathroom. I just put my lantern away, closed my tent flap, and held it all night. I don't remember sleeping that night. I might have, I might not, but if I did, it was dreamless. I do remember that I tried to hide this experience the next day, asking if my friend and his family had heard any howling. While they did hear the howling, they told me they just ignored it, thinking it was a coyote doing coyote stuff. I was encouraged to just ignore it, as if I was a city kid who had never heard coyote howling before. The next day I stayed as close to my friend as possible while exploring and had nearly forgotten the encounter by lunch. Somehow, the safety I had been feeling during the day put the beast out of my mind, until we found tracks in that super sandy place. Coyote tracks. I think seeing those tracks confirmed to me that it wasn't just some dream, and because of that I showed enough fear that night to convince my friend's family to let me sleep in their tent. Even in the comfort of a warmer tent, more people means more warmth, and in the presence of an adult, the father, and two other people, my friend and his sister, I couldn't sleep that night. I'd nearly drift into sleep and then I'd hear a coyote howl. The next day I pretended to be sick and got my mother to drive up and take me home a day or two early. Worst camping trip of my life. It ruined not only my whole summer, but also just ruined camping for me. I haven't been camping without a tent buddy since, and I don't plan to. Even then, I'm never comfortable, always listening for strange noises and acting paranoid. This really messed me up, I guess, being forced to see that a human, top of the food chain, is utterly powerless in front of such a beast. Seriously, I don't think I can press hard enough to make everyone realize how powerless I really felt. Even today, when I think about this, I remember two things first. Those eyes and that feeling. Just writing this sent multiple shivers up my spine. That said, you might be asking why I'm talking about this again if it terrifies me so much. I just want answers, and I want to add to the conversation of this topic. I feel the need to add this encounter so that others can experience it, maybe contact me with questions or answers. So let me say now that if you have any idea what happened that night, please respond. If you have any questions, do the same. I have questions, but uh, this guy deleted his account, and he is uncontactable. I mean, maybe he was taken by Dogman. Who knows? But the um, story's long, and it's pretty fantastic. And the guy was a kid when he had his, his experience, so that, that probably um, adds to the level of fear that he portrayed in the story. But who wouldn't be afraid at something like that, to be honest, right? I mean, sounds pretty horrifying. 
I had an experience in the woods too that killed camping for me for quite some time and only just recently did I start camping solo again. But um, an experience like that in the woods when you're all alone camping somewhere, that can really mess you up so I totally understand where he's coming from. This next story comes from my neck of the woods so of course I had to include it. Uh, special thanks to Trigger1154 on Reddit for letting me tell this story. I was able to reach out and he did give me permission to tell this story. If uh, you guys have heard this story before, it is because it has been featured on other podcasts. So, um, so sorry if this is like a repeat story for you guys, but I found it pretty fascinating. Um, during my teenage years, around 16 or 17, I encountered something inexplicable in the forests near Danbury, Wisconsin. At that time, I stood at an imposing height of six foot four, and my lifestyle was that of an athlete and survivalist. I was deeply into hunting, camping, and martial arts. Like many teenagers, I was somewhat overconfident, perhaps even a little bit arrogant about my abilities in the wilderness, feeling almost invincible. Our family cabin, nestled on Long Lake in Danbury, was surrounded by dense forests the kind of terrain I was intimately familiar with. It was during a summer vacation there, a beautiful and sweltering season, that I found myself in the company of my cousin and grandparents. On one particular day, my cousin and I decided to engage in an airsoft battle. I took the game seriously, kitted out in a full battle dress uniform, BDU, in woodland camo, complete with a camouflage mask. My cousin, in contrast, opted for a casual attire of jeans and a t-shirt. The battle naturally veered into the woods, a setting I felt at home in. We were about 150 meters deep into the forest when I decided to play a prank on my cousin. I hushed him and whispered ominously that we were being watched, hoping to spook him. But the joke quickly lost its humor when I noticed the eerie silence that had fallen over the woods the kind of oppressive quiet that usually signals the presence of a large predator. I was on high alert almost instantly. As I scanned our surroundings, a chilling sight caught my eye. About 40 meters away at the edge of a clearing was a creature, its whitish teeth stark against its reddish-brown fur. It was crouched, gripping a tree with its left hand, panting and attentively watching us with its ears pricked. In that moment, my mind could only rationalize it as a werewolf. I instinctively told my cousin that we needed to leave. He took off running, and as he did, the creature charged. It sprinted on two legs for a brief distance before dropping to all fours in pursuit. As I ran, the sound of the creature crashing through the woods behind us was terrifyingly close. We didn't stop until we reached the safety of our cabin. There, we discussed the incident. I'm not sure if my cousin saw the creature as I did. I told him it might have been a bear to avoid alarming him, but I knew better. That was no bear. This experience led me to research similar encounters, drawing me to various dogman-related websites. The descriptions I found resonated eerily with what I had seen. Since then, my respect for nature has deepened significantly. I approach the wilderness with much more caution, always armed when alone though I prefer not to venture solo. This encounter taught me an invaluable lesson. Always trust your instincts and respect the unknown mysteries of nature. This is an interesting story to me because it seems like if these guys didn't make it to their cabin, they may very well have been attacked by this thing. And when it comes to dogman encounters, there's plenty of stories of dogman sort of half chasing but not a whole lot of stories of people actually being attacked by Dogman. That being said, I can easily see how this story could have led to a much darker end. And that's one of the reasons that I really wanted to share that story. There's so many Dogman stories to share, like these brief recollections that even made it into mainstream media. One from Ohio said, People need to be made aware of these things. They are as real as it gets, and they are dangerous. I've always loved nature. I love the woods. I love hiking and camping and fishing. On this occasion, I was by a lake for 15 minutes when all of a sudden, this overwhelming feeling of dread came over me. 
I switched my headlamp on and turned around to start back up the river bank, and right behind a big sycamore tree, I saw what looked to be a very large animal kind of kneeling beside it. As I locked my eyes on it, I completely froze. I knew I was definitely seeing something there, but my mind couldn't process it. What I was looking at didn't make any sense. I kept saying to myself, animals aren't supposed to look like that. Right as I'm thinking this, it's as if this thing read my mind. It stood up and made itself perfectly visible. You know, the monsters your parents told you weren't real and couldn't hurt you? I've heard of the dog man before, but never really took it seriously. These things are perfectly adapted, killing machines. The way the arms and legs looked, it looked like it was perfectly adapted to walk on all fours as well as on two legs. Another shared his experience, saying, This experience has torn a huge hole in me. When he stopped in a clearing, a genetically mixed entity of man, wolf, and primate suddenly stepped out. He said, I spent 21 years in the army, all over the world and in three different theaters of war, and I've barely slept at all since seeing this thing, an enormous canine-type creature. I can still taste the fear in my throat and in my own vomit. I am six foot tall and about 250 pounds, and this thing dwarfed me, at least seven foot six and maybe 350 to 400 pounds. As a former college and semi-pro football player and powerlifter, I know about big people and about strength. And this was no normal creature that evolved somehow in that environment. I can promise you this is not something anyone would want to encounter twice. Another witness, a deputy sheriff, said there ain't many things in the world that scare me. Put simply, I've seen some stuff in my days, but nothing prepared me for that night. I recall there was a search for a young man who had been sucked into a storm drain, and I parked my cruiser at what I believe was the electric company storage yard. About five minutes pass before I hear a snorting, almost sniffing sound coming from the other side of the tracks. I turned my light, and to this day, I wish I hadn't. It had pointed ears and a long muzzle, and it looked me right in the face before it bolted into the timber. It was not a mask, and it was not a person in a costume. Who would walk up on an armed man with a police radio in full uniform and risk getting shot? I remember it was surreal. So final, I guess. I know what's in the dark now. And this last one, guys, this last one is probably one of the coolest dogman stories I've ever encountered. And it's actually kind of a separate cryptid altogether, but in the same dogman vein. And I might even do a full episode on this thing because it is insane. Obviously, with stories like this, there's various parts that are debated as to whether they're true or not. Apparently, when it comes to names, people take that stuff really seriously because you can just look up names these days. And if that person isn't found, a lot of these stories are just kind of thrown out the window as not true because the person in the story, according to records, never existed. As much as I respect research like that names can be changed names can be made up to hide the real identities of people and also legends grow over time legends do change and with the changing of legends sometimes names change as well but there was enough here and enough sources to look at that I thought, you know, this is an awesome story to include, not only in this group of stories, but also maybe to look at for a future episode. So here we go. In the year 1919, newspapers across Oklahoma were abuzz with a spine-chilling tale from Captain F.J. Newhouse, a Canadian veteran of World War I. His story, steeped in the horrors of war and shadowed by supernatural elements, claimed that Allied soldiers in the trenches at Mons faced a terror beyond the human enemy, a monstrous beast that hunted them in the dark. The eerie account began in 1914 with Captain Yeskes of the London Fusiliers leading a patrol of four soldiers into the treacherous expanse of no man's land. When they failed to return, initial fears were of German capture. However, the truth was far more unsettling. Days later, their bodies were discovered 
in a horrifying state, mauled and marked by deep teeth wounds at their throats. The subsequent events unfolded like a nightmarish tale. Soldiers reported hearing ghastly howls piercing the night, and unsettling movements were glimpsed beyond the barbed wire. Patrols venturing into no man's land met gruesome fates, their bodies often found savaged by some unseen and ferocious creature. Then, as mysteriously as it had appeared, the beast vanished into the annals of war legends. The bizarre mystery seemingly found its resolution in the post-war chaos. A German scientist, Gottlieb Hochmuller, perished in a riot in Berlin. His death revealed a sinister plot that stretched the boundaries of belief. Hochmuller had allegedly transplanted the brain of a madman into a massive Siberian wolfhound and released it into no man's land. This monstrous creation was part of a series of experiments aimed at turning the tide of war in Germany's favor. The feasibility of such a plot, especially in ending a global conflict, of course, remained highly dubious. But we know those Germans were up to crazy stuff and that they believed in these kinds of monsters. Despite Captain Newhouse's status as a genuine soldier, the story's authenticity seems to rapidly unravel upon closer examination. And this is where some of the details become debatable, and a lot of people use these debatable details to render this story nothing more than lies and hogwash. But apparently there's no historical record of a scientist named Gottlieb Hochmuller, nor was there a Captain Yeskes in the London Fusiliers. The rarity of the name Yeskes in England contrasted with its prevalence in Canada and America suggests that Newhouse likely fabricated the entire tale. Or those identities had been changed, hidden, or mistaken. We've seen this before where stories are real but certain details are omitted or changed to protect identities or to keep secrets. The Battle of Mons is also renowned for another legend, the Angels of Mons. Now the Angels of Mons are kind of interesting because the story of the Angels of Mons originally came out as a newspaper article. And it talked about these angelic beings that appeared to be protecting British soldiers during the Battle of Mons. And at this same Battle of Mons, and Mons in general, is where this dogman style creature, this alleged creation of Germany's war machine, was said to prowl. I don't think it's too far fetched to consider the possibility of spiritual beings fighting in wartime amongst human beings. I think that this is one example of perhaps such a battle where there are beings of good and beings of evil that are fighting alongside mankind. It's up to you guys. What do you guys think of all that stuff? I thought that story was so cool that I'm, I'm probably going to end up doing a Cryptids of Wartime episode very soon, and I might even give the, uh, the Dogman Beast of Mons a closer look because... It's honestly, I think there's a lot there. So there you have it, guys. Thanks for tuning in. Don't forget to like, follow, and subscribe. Remember, don't drink the water and question everything.